Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Hearts for Health building for our second housing workforce housing community meeting. Just cover a couple of basic logistics for you this evening. Bathrooms are out this door and to your left, and we are recording this Zoom meeting for everyone here in the room and online so that we can watch it in the future. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to tonight's second community meeting on workforce housing being hosted by Working at Home. I'm Sarah Miller, and I am the Deputy Director of the North Historian Economic Development District. And I am going to be um, mostly facilitating the meeting this evening. I'm a member of the Working Homes Advisory Group. Oh, yes. John just asked me if I had a microphone. <laughs> Does anybody want me to repeat that? Raise your hand. No, once was enough. So thanks for coming tonight. Uh, I want to go ahead and just review a few things before we started. Go ahead, Adam. Oh, who's advancing? So the purpose of tonight's meeting is to review some of the community engagement that we've had so far and to also share updates on projects that we have started in Wolau and Enterprise and Joseph. And then um, we want to have some questions and answers about the information that's provided. And the focus of that is to hear from people who are in need of workforce housing and to learn more about what kinds of housing they need and other questions they may have about what's going on. There will also be, uh, we keep reminding people that there are some additional ways to give input. We are going to be hosting some small group discussions for people who are in need of workforce housing. And those will be happening in September. So that will be kind of a smaller gathering where people can, you know, maybe feel a little more comfortable. Whoops, there goes that one about having conversations. And there, there are sign-up sheets on the tables for that. And we will also have an online sign-up at the Working Homes um, website. So people who are not at the meeting or for those of you who are online, you will have an opportunity to sign up to participate in those. And we'll probably have some in person and then we'll probably have a virtual option so people who want to gather virtually can do that as well. So ground rules, um, we want to keep it civil. People have different experiences, perspectives, and opinions, and we are all linked, so it's good for us to practice sharing those. Um, we are asking people to hold questions to the end. There are some note cards on the tables, and those can be used to provide written comments if you'd like to give a written comment. And just to remind people, we are going to be focusing the meeting on getting feedback from people who are here because they, they are uh, affected by this problem. And so we want to have them be part of this conversation. Go ahead. So Working Homes LLC is a nonprofit. It is a fully owned subsidiary of Willow Resources. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Willow Resources. It's a long standing nonprofit organization that kind of got into real estate and repurposing of buildings to meet community needs by taking ownership of both the hospital building. And now I think it houses maybe 25 or more organizations. So they've done a great job of meeting a need in the community. And one of the things that happened over the past 15 years, probably as this, uh, that we saw diminishing availability of housing for people working in the community. Prices were going up beyond what they could afford. And so as that was happening and people started to have more conversations, there really wasn't an organization that was willing to step in and try to figure out where to start doing something. And so well, our resources board um, back in the end of last year agreed to form working homes as a way to bring people together and to be a, a kind of a reliable and steady partner in that and to foster collaboration among other organizations and people in the community that want to be part of finding solutions to the workforce housing crisis. So one way to think about 
this challenge is just to think about the way that housing costs have gone up and wages have not gone up to the same extent. And we've provided in previous meetings and presentations in the community a lot of information on how we got to where we are and why we're trying to meet this need. Tonight we're going to talk more about what we've done so far, what we've heard from the community, and where we're going next. So some of the things that we've heard so far, um, both in the first community meeting and through the housing survey, which had about 250 responses, is that there are housing needs that exist at all income levels. And what we are focusing on is the property of, for the middle income workforce housing. And that is defined as $40,000 to $95,000 a year. So that's a, a just kind of think about that, that when we're having these conversations, this is kind of the annual gross income that we're looking at for people who are really priced out of the home ownership market and are seeing decreasing numbers of options and very high priced and often inadequate options for rental housing. Another thing that um, we heard is that the housing that we try to develop to meet this need should align with community values. And there's a number of ways that that's happening, but an important one to think about is that these homes should be well designed. They should be sustainable. They should be energy efficient, and they should contribute to the attractiveness of the neighborhood. Another thing that we've heard, which has been really inspiring, and there's probably some people in this room right now tonight who have come forward wanting to be part of the solution, and that is that people have been coming to Nils, I think primarily, but oftentimes to other members of the advisory committee to say, hey, I, this is important to me. I think this is a real problem. And I have a piece of property that, you know, I'm gonna build a home on, but I can build three more homes. And I wanna talk to you about how this might happen. Um, people have said, hey, you know, I, I would like to partner, I'd like to form some kind of development partnership and look at what I can do with my piece of land that's already zoned for housing. Or I have a subdivision and I might look at setting aside a few of my lots to support workforce housing. Or I might actually be able to build an apartment building. So there are a lot of people who are once now that now that there's some place to go, unfortunately Bill gets a lot of it, but it's really exciting to see that. And of course, um, this is, you know, this is new for most of us that are trying to do this. And the reason workforce housing is so challenging is because there aren't a lot of um, game plans to follow. And so we're, you know, we started two years ago, who's got a game plan and what, how, what does it look like? And now we're, we're figuring out what is the game plan and we're all counting. Um, the other thing that we've heard is a lot about types of housing that people who need workforce housing are looking for. And we need to know more about that. And so tonight is part of finding out more and the small group discussions will be part of finding out more. So that's a really important um, piece of the community engagement. The workforce housing survey that I mentioned, it's now closed and we will post those results online. Those responses are already being used to inform kind of the strategies that we're looking at for workforce housing. And the additional input, of course, that I mentioned, the opportunity to do some small group discussions in September. So we encourage people to sign up, tell others that you know that need workforce housing and are here to please go online and, and let us know if they want to be part of that. Now I get to hand it off. Hey, hey. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah. That was great. Um, I'm Nils Christopherson. I'm the executive director of Valar Resources and the manager of Working Homes LLC. Um, 
we're working on uh as, as sarah mentioned it's been um it's been really uh inspiring and heartening to see the um response we've had from the community with ideas about um where the needs are how we might solve the problem who wants to lend a hand and and where there's actually potential land so there's quite a lot of people that have stepped up with uh with suggestions about how we might solve this we're currently focused right now we have limited capacity we have not yet hired staff for this new entity so we're doing this in addition to our work at Bullard resources and the advisory board all has their own time jobs um so we're focused on three projects right now and the one that is moving fastest is uh, is a relatively new project that we uh that has emerged i think since the first meeting which is uh the opportunity to develop uh up to three single family de detached homes uh, housing units in Wallawa in the urban growth boundary um just sort of behind the assembly of god church and sort of across the highway from the new clinic uh it's a it's a half acre lot with an existing five bedroom two bath home that we will repair and improve this fall. Uh, we will then work with the city council, seated here, some of them, uh, to uh, uh, pursue a lot partition, create two more buildable lots, and we're lining up funding and a contractor to build a second small home, a two bedroom, one bath home by the summer of next year, by the summer of 2024. And then with the intent to build a third home in 2025. Um, and right now um, we're still exploring what the market need is uh, about whether that would be sold uh, to, to new owners or rented. And we've got the option to do either with, with all three of those units. The second one, which we uh, we did mention last time is ongoing conversations with uh, Ralph Swinehart about the em and building that um, is currently providing 27 residential apartment units uh, at this workforce housing price point um, and <laughs> six commercial spaces. And uh, we're working on a transition plan with Ralph to ensure that that population continues to be met with this housing stock. Um, we've also uh, supported Ralph in his partnership with Energy Trust Oregon to begin to improve the heating and cooling systems in there, converting um, units from electric baseboard over to ductless heat pumps. Um, and our intention is to uh, complete acquisition with Ralph by the end of the year. And then uh, the one that drew quite a lot of attention over the summer is uh, the opportunity uh, to explore a larger development on a 20 acre vacant parcel uh, within the Joseph City limits that is zoned R2 uh, and allows for a mix of housing types. Um, in terms of its zoning and location, it would make a fabulous place to build workforce housing. So we continue to explore that uh, with our team here uh, and their civil engineers. And then we're also doing other evaluations, including um, the phase one environmental assessment and our own financial planning around that. Um, but I think we're gonna shift here and allow our team from Scott Edwards Architects to present some of the ideas uh, for that site that, uh, the, the possibilities for the site. Who's first? Let's see, let's, let's see. Do you want me to come on around here or is this okay? It's for Kurt Vig. Okay. So, hi everyone. Um, I'm Peter Grimm, uh, one of the principal architects with Scott Edwards Architecture, as Mills uh, indicated. And uh, so, we are, I want to just tell you a little bit about who we are and kind of our role on the project and then each one of us, we're gonna present a little bit of some of our preliminary work to you guys tonight. So we're really excited to show you some cool stuff. Um, but just really briefly, um, so we're a Portland-based company um, and we've been doing community-based projects throughout Oregon 
uh, for the better part of the past 25 years. Um, and I've been there for about 24 of those years. So we've seen, we've seen lots of really cool stuff all around the state, everything um, from uh, worker housing to clinics to uh, library work, civic buildings, fire stations, um, in places like Klamath Falls, uh, Coos Bay, uh, Boardman, little sure you folks, uh, Hermiston, Pendleton, et cetera. Um, so the work that we're engaged with here is very much kind of part of, has, has been a part of the ethos of our company since day one. So uh, we're really, really privileged and thrilled to be uh, helping folks out on this project. Um, so our role on this project will is really primarily three things. Um, the first one is what we're doing right now. Okay, we, we want to listen to the community, hear your guys' concerns, uh, understand what those concerns really, where that comes from, um, and to, um, you know, listen as well to make some of the ideas that you guys may have about what this project wants to be, because the best ideas really come from the community. And we've seen that many, many times in many communities around the state. So we're really, that's number one, listening is absolutely paramount. Before we do any design work, before we do anything, we really want to understand the community. We, we, nobody knows the community better than you guys that live, work, and recreate here every day, and we fully um, recognize that. So that's number one. Number two is a little bit more of a nuts and bolts uh, task. We are, um, in, in, with regard to the 20-acre parcel in Joseph, we're doing some what we call site analysis and site assessment along with our civil engineer partner. Um, so looking at everything from topography to the soil capacity to you know support foundations, et cetera, to drainage uh, the and the ability of the local infrastructure to support uh, development of some scale yet to be determined on that property. So that's that's number two, and we're going to show you some. Oh, we're going to share some of our initial findings with you tonight in that point. And the last thing is really design. So maybe what you traditionally think of an architect is actually doing is taking everything that we've learned and heard and folding that in to start to give shape to the project. So an architectural angle, um, something that feels we do our job right. Um, that feels very appropriate for the community, something if you're driving by or through or or even to the project as a resident, you know, you feel like, hey, this is the right sized, this is the right scale and the right style, really, for Joseph and something that you guys can be um, proud of. So um, we're going to share some imagery on that front too tonight and just to kind of start that conversation and start to build a design book vocabulary. So we have a common language when we're talking about ideas in the in the coming uh, meetings. So that's a little bit about who we are and kind of our, our role here. Um, I think as we talked about, you guys may have questions. We're gonna have, we're gonna pull those to the end. We're happy to answer those for you guys tonight. Um, and we're also gonna be back. So we're gonna have more opportunities to connect. And we're actually really excited to do the um, participate in the small group sessions and really engage and it's a fun process. So I guess that said, I want to introduce my colleague, uh, Haley Purdy. Haley is our project manager, uh, which is essentially means she's herding the cats um, and all, keeping us uh, focused and uh, moving forward. So Haley. Thank you. Well, like you said, I'm Haley Purdy. Just to humanize me a little bit, um, I've been working at Scott Edwards for over eight years now. Um, had the pleasure of working on a variety of uh, multifamily affordable housing, as well as a lot of lovely community-based projects. Um, this is why I work at Scott Edwards, to be honest, is so that we get to do this type of engagement um, and let the community influence and be involved in the process. So, um, Thank you for including us uh, today. Would you mind going to the next slide? I'm going to talk about the very exciting civil engineer due diligence. Um, 
This is gonna be very high level. We don't expect you to read all of the detailed information up on the screen. Like uh, we said before, it'll be available online. But uh, generally when we say that the civil engineer is doing due diligence, what we're looking for is information about your site um, and what the site can support. And so what that means for this 20 acre, par 20 acre parcel in Joseph is um, we look at the transportation and the parking. Um, it's fed to the site by two roads currently um, at the top, Daggart and the bottom, Maple. And those sites will be connecting onto this property. And so that's one of the first things we look at the civil engineer with is how do you connect to this property? And we work with them to also understand parking. Um, so we know what the city's requirements are for parking for the number of units. Um, we also take a look at some of the utilities out here. Um, last time you we were here, we heard the community ask some really articulate questions about what the site can support and what the city's utilities support. Um, it was a great question to be asked of us. And um, I can say that the civil engineer was already doing the due diligence and looking into that. And so we know, as many of you might know, that there is no stormwater management in the city of Joseph, but we do know that there is adequate water supply in the city of Joseph to, to supply the development on this site. We're also working with the city um, and their engineers to determine when it comes to um, sanitary, what those capacities are. We're also talking with this uh, lovely board about trying to understand how the development comes about. Um, a 20 acre parcel is a fairly large site. It's not something that I think anyone is looking to develop all at once. And so when we look at a civil engineer's scope of work, we're not understanding just what the capacity of the site is, but what the capacity of the city is. And what this site um, really supports is a phasing um, to support your city's utilities. And that comes down to something like sanitary. Um, we know that you guys have Verizon as your communication provider, very exciting. Um, and we know you have no natural gas. So these are all things that we start to take a look at as we think about the types of systems that might need to be supported to um, uh, support the housing when it talks about, you know, heating and cooling and electric. Um, and then last but not least, uh, the civil engineer is very involved in looking at the earth working reading. Um, not sure if you've all been over there to see this beautiful parcel, but it's really a lovely site. And like Peter was eloquently saying before, um, being mindful of the elevation out there, the topography, um, the natural um, uh, existing landscaping that's there is something that we take very seriously and very much in mind as we do the development and the design of the site. And so we work with the civil engineer to understand what is referred to as the grading and the topography of the site. And we will be working with that topography, right? And not against it. And so that's something that's really important in that development. Um, I'm gonna hand the microphone over to Tom. Tom is the project architect on the project. And he's gonna talk a little bit about some of that uh, site analysis that we do. Thank you. Thanks, Haley. Uh, yeah, my name is Tom Byrne. I've been with uh, Scott Edwards for about as long as Haley. Um, done quite a bit of master planning, uh, working in housing, single family, all the way up to multifamily apartments, working with universities as well, um, and some uh, civic projects. And one of the things that we start to look at right away is not sort of the design of the buildings. It's where is this going to be? It's really important to understand where the location of these, um, this house or this development is going to end up. And so this map here represents um, the location of the site. And uh, we're actually thrilled to find out that it's actually within the city limits. So we're not expanding the city at all. Um, but it's also its connection to highways, to roads, to um, the lake down to the south, to Enterprise, to the north. Um, so, it, and it's also it's really important to understand its connection to um, things like the downtown. Is this walkable? Can you just walk there? And it seems like you know, somebody could probably walk the 10 blocks to downtown. And so that begins to form our ideas about how to develop this. And is this sort of a car heavy space or can you bring in bicycles? Um, do people want to walk them here? Um, and also what kind of you know, shopping and, you know, access to grocery stores and access to work, access to play. 
Um, and so this seems to actually have all of that. Um, and when we look at the site, luckily we've been able to come out and visit it because that's important too. Because um, you can do all this research, look at the site, look at the topography, look at the surveys, look at the sewer connections, to understand all of that, understand the zoning. Um, but then you go out to a site and you look at it and everything changes. And uh, we got to bring Amy here out for the first time and her, her perspective of everything has just changed now. You should start to see it in person. Um, next slide. So then we zoom in a little bit. So first we zoom out as far as we can and then zoom in and understand um, some of the features of the site. It's, it's access from downtown on the two streets that are coming through this newer development. Um, it's shaped really by sort of the fields to the north, properties to the east and west, and then the um, drainage ditch to the south, which creates that kind of interesting um, property line there. It's also sloping. We understand it's sloping from the north towards the south, about 30 feet total. And it's got this gray stripe in here is that I'm representing a small ridge where it just sort of drops a little bit. And we're thinking, well, how can we incorporate this into the development and not fight it? You know, so we're not moving as much dirt around. We're always sort of like, how do we cut and fill in such a way that we're not having to dump soil places or bring in a whole lot of soil? Um, we've got nice connections to utilities. Uh, and we look at things like views. I mean, pretty much every direction, we've got this spectacular view. Uh, you know, where where's the sun? Where do what you want front and back porches? You want to be able to sit on your back porch and see the sunset? It might, might be nice. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, so we start to look at how this site, um, from the sort of the technical aspect starts to feel, but also from just the, the feeling of the nature of it. And it's sort of, it's nice to actually spend a little bit of time out there as well. Just get to know the site a little before, you know, before understanding what kind of buildings want to go on here, um, and how to start dividing it up. Because it's what's actually important in a development like this is not necessarily the buildings themselves, but the space in between the buildings, the streets, the sidewalks, the community space, the front and backyards. That really becomes important. Um, and we'll show those in a little bit in the, in the uh, slides that we have. Um, so from there, we start to look at the actual building types. Um, and this next slide, which uh, Amy Cripps is going to talk about, is to do with the types of buildings and types of houses that we might start to place on this site. So, Amy? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Amy Cripps. I'm a designer here at SEA. I've been here for about six years, almost. Um, and I've been working on mostly multifamily affordable housing and community-based projects. Um, slipped a little bit of the Oregon Humane Society in there. It's a, another one. Um, so before I hand it back off to Tom, and he's gonna show you some images of some housing types, I thought we really bring it back and kind of start at the beginning of what is this missing this middle housing type? Um, and so the missing middle is, it provides a diversity of housing options. And basically that diversity of housing types meets that diversity of income levels. And as we said, the priority is this middle income, which is that affordable, that can be affordable for everybody. And so when you have, when you have more units, that brings the cost of the unit down, which makes them more affordable. Um, so I'm just gonna go starting from left to right. Um, so on the left here, we have the single family, um, uh, uh, detached houses. And as we talked about earlier, we talked about converting some of those single family into um, workforce housing. And what's um, interesting about this missing middle is that um, these house scale buildings fit into the existing residential neighborhood. Um, and th the point is to try to create, how do we create a neighborhood? Because um, as you see here in Joseph, it's mostly that single family um, residential and uh, the missing middle is kind of that in between from the single family to the larger apartment buildings. Um, and so the next one on the list is the ADU, which is an accessory dwelling unit. 
And so these are one to two story homes and they're on the same lot as the existing house. And they're more of an accessory to the main dwelling unit. And so they're smaller scale around the 800 square feet. And then the next one is the cottage cluster. It's a group of small one to one half story homes and they're detached. And they're arranged around a shared open space and they each have their own individual entrances. And it's really about, it's not so much about the backyard, but it's more about the front yard and everyone's facing each other. And parking tends to be more of a common um, parking lot versus you have a, a, your own driveway or something like that. Next one is a duplex, and it's a, a small one to two story detached uh, home that consists of two dwelling units arranged either side by side horizontally or they're stacked vertically. Uh, and they each have their own individual entry and they can include either detached or detached parking. And then the next one is a townhouse. Um, these are about two story and they can range from uh, probably suited for this area is around three to four attached single family homes. They're placed side by side. And so they share a common wall. Um, they have their own individual entrances and they either have uh, detached or attached parking. Uh, the next one is the stack flats. And that's a two-story shared or individual entries from the street to apartments, and they're either arranged side by side or they can be stacked. Next one is co-housing. It's a one to two story, and basically it's a room with shared facilities. So she'll have a shared bathroom and kitchen and exterior common spaces. And then the last one is the walk-up. And this is usually two to three stories, and you'll have one common entrance, and it's an apartment style. You don't have shared facilities, everything's within your apartment. And then um, just the one on the end is a typical apartment building. This is usually three to four stories, an elevator building, more of the larger scale. So what we're really looking at is this missing middle housing type. And Tom's gonna show you some images um, so you can connect these with these diagrams. Thanks, Amy. So one of the things, one of the reasons um, we're here is to really understand what your community, what, what makes a home a home to you. Because we need to build smaller footprints and smaller homes to make it more affordable. And that's part of what you're seeing up here in this missing middle. <clears throat> to do this effectively, we need to be very efficient on the spaces. We can't have maybe a theater room or a big gym or, you know, some kind of space like that. Um, it might be a community space, but um, so really getting down to what's important to you. Um, and then that's what helps to make, helps us understand what that makes a home, what, what makes a home to you. Um, Cause then if we can do that, we can say pair, say a front, a living room to a front porch. We can pair a dining room to a back deck. Um, we can open up the kitchen to the dining room and that, uh, uh, that there may be things that are really important to this community, to you, um, that you see as like essential, it has to be in a home. And then we can incorporate those things. If, um, the other part of it is what's important to you as a community. Um, and that could be the entire community of Joseph um, or the smaller sort of neighborhood community. Um, what is it that you feel makes this a community? What's important to that part of it? Is it a playground? Is it um, a private backyard that you know you want to be in? Is it what when you come to Joseph and you're living here, what is it that's important to you? Why is it different than living somewhere else? Um, I, I know why it's different than living in Portland because you're coming from Portland and you just immediately feel decompressed coming here. You immediately feel the open space. Um, and so understanding that in a more granular way will be important. I think we can get that maybe some questions and answers after this or, you know, during some of these um, sessions that we're going to have when we come back, we can really start to hone in on that. Um, so these next slides that I'm going to show you are really just images of homes um, and the different types. So we haven't actually done any design yet. Uh, because we didn't think it was appropriate. We, we can design homes all day long, but as Peter was alluding, this is really about your community. And once we understand that and have a better understanding of that, we'll be able to design something that's appropriate. 
So this is just to get you sort of talking and thinking about these different kinds of housing types um, and then the spaces in between them and, and then the parks and so on that can go along with it. And so we'll just maybe jump into the next slide a little bit. This, this first slide uh, represents all single family home types. So these are detached, single family, so the first one is the uh, accessible dwelling unit you can see in the lower left, left here. It could be a small, you know, three or 400 square foot studio up to a one or two bedroom, 800 square foot, two, two story um, dwelling. That's usually a tighter footprint, usually, you know, about 400 square foot footprint. Um, it's part of an existing home. It could be a, a um, either a rental or somebody you know is staying there or you can, um, it, it just helps to um, increase density without it feeling overwhelming and going onto the same property and without destroying the existing house as well. Um, but it is um, standalone. The cottage is actually a fairly similar size to the ADU, maybe a little bit bigger, but then we start to put a group of those together. Um, and that starts to create a sort of an incident little neighborhood and community. And what they often do is they share front yards. You might have, there's this nice little sort of difference between public and private. And that private place might be say your front door and front porch and a little garden out front, but then you've got some kind of a walkway. And beyond that, you have some kind of a, a communal front yard or I've seen them with communal backyards as well. Um, oftentimes the parking, could, it could be covered or not, but it's often off to the side and then you walk to your cottage. Um, with That helps uh, bring the scale down, but it also in, helps to increase the density as well. You can get quite a few families in a similar area that you might only be able to get, say, um, half as many single family homes. Then um, next step up from that is your more traditional single family home. Uh, we're showing that on the right here, two different forms, one sort of a little bit more traditional gable two-story, uh, one sort of, you know, more, more modern with a flat roof. But something you see in common in all of these are the importance of things like front porches, back decks, sidewalks, um, space around it. With the traditional single family home, you usually have some kind of a fenced yard, everything is kind of your space, and then the street becomes a common area. In um, the cottage cluster and the smaller the ADU, it can be actually more shared space. And that can help um, reduce the cost of construction, and which is also the cost of the um, sale price of the home and makes it more affordable for people. Let's move on. The next grouping of housing is basically multifamily. Um, and this is, can be single family homes that are attached, or it can be sort of more apartment style. These can be for sale. So like a, a duplex might be two homes that are side by side that are for sale, but a flat might be the similar thing, but it could be for rent. Um, so, so up in the upper left, you see something could be say co-housing where you have your space, it's a little smaller, and then uh, maybe there's a communal kitchen, um, a communal laundry area, so that what you're purchasing is actually a um, significantly smaller space and more affordable, and then you pay some kind of a fee to be able to use these communal spaces. Uh, the next slide up there is more sort of your duplex, uh, but it's also a mix. Uh, I think that first one is actually a, a fourplex, and then it goes to a duplex, but you can, it's not like we're thinking um, all of these will be, you know, the whole area will just be all duplexes. I think it's gonna be a mix of all different kinds of housing types. And that allows um, people of different levels of income to be able to buy into different types of housing. And also not only different levels, but also different stages in life. You know, are you, um, now retired and, and just needs a smaller space? Are you thinking about having kids? Are you single and just want to, or are you here just, just to work for a year or summer? Um, you know, so that having a variety of types of housing 
gives you the option to have a variety of types of people that are moving in. Uh, the one on the upper right is a pretty classic kind of duplex. Um, it looks like two houses, but the shared wall, you've got one, one quarter of your home is shared, which actually helps really reduce the cost of uh, construction. You've also got utilities and everything kind of coming together in one space. Um, it's a little tighter. You can get maybe a shared driveway, shared cardboard. Um, the similar one on the on lower left here, but that could be a flat because it's perhaps stacked on top of each other. The one in the middle, on the lower middle, that would be more sort of row house type. And you can put those are two story. And the advantage of maybe bring those together is that the total amount of people you can fit into that footprint allows for things like communal spaces. You can see in there also a community room as well. So if you know you do end up with it in a smaller space that's more affordable, you feel like you can get out and you have a communal space, a larger area. So instead of your, your smaller front yard or backyard, you've got a larger area where you can go throw a Frisbee and um, run the dog. Uh, this lower right here is probably is a triplex. Um, so they're all multifamily homes, but you'll see a sort of a similarity to the style and look of the single family home. They've got the gable roofs. Um, and the simpler we keep that construction, the better. It's not only good for um, the cost effectiveness of it, but also long-term maintenance. If you've got one gable and a simple roof to take care of, it's going to be a lot less than taking care of something with you know, six different dormers and all kinds of crickets. And um, the, the thing that helps make these then interesting is adding on porches, adding on dormers, adding on um, simple things that help really make it look um, a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more home-like. You can, by doing the window treatment, by doing the trim around it, by adding the, the columns, those are all things that really help make it, make it uh, help it feel more like a home. Um, and also, if you have multiple buildings together, the, those buildings clustered together help make it, you know, get, that gives it that sort of complexity and that dynamic and, and that sense of neighborhood. Um, even though some of these appear fairly dense and a lot denser than perhaps you've seen in Joseph, it's actually sort of the same amount of people just in a smaller footprint. Um, and that's, that was part of our intention, isn't to just go ahead and get as many people on this site as possible. Because um, what's probably gonna limit it is the sewer connection is my guess. It's not even the R2, the, the zoning. Zoning could allow, I won't even tell you how many people can be on there, how many houses, it's, you know, but we have to look at everything, trips, parking, connections to utilities, all these things, and something is ultimately gonna limit it. Um, but there's also just what feels right. Um, how many do you need? How much housing do you need? And so we don't necessarily have to develop the entire thing. We don't know all at once. We can uh, phase it out. We also don't need necessarily need to develop every piece of land, or every square foot of land too. We really want to be able to, again, focus on the idea of sidewalks, open space, communal space, and then the houses can easily then fit around that. And what style that house takes is kind of, um, it's it's become, it's, it, we can design it and we can make it feel and look as if it fits into Joseph, but it's almost more important to get the street layouts and the sidewalks and the open space layout. That's what's important to get right. Um, and then we can figure out, because we, we're also not allowed to go over two stories, which is perfect. So. We don't want to go three or four stories here. Um, but I think the zoning actually fits in pretty well with what we're trying to do. So that's that's essentially the, we didn't want to pick too many slides here. We just wanted to um, throw a few out there, a few images so that we can express the idea that, you know, this type of housing doesn't necessarily need to look radically different than the type of housing that maybe you were used to seeing. Um, but if we can build it a little bit smarter, a little bit smaller, um, we can make it more affordable. And then really our, our target would be to make it um, very livable. You know, we 
when we think about design of a, a room, we think about how what kind of furniture is going in there. You know, where is the dining room table going to go? How do you move around that space? And if we can get all, we can bring all that together. You don't need a gigantic space. Um, you can you can make it more a little more intimate, but it'll feel just as big. And if you place the windows just right, you've got that borrowed landscape too. Oh, we do have one more slide now. Speaking of borrowed landscape. Uh, how does this all fit into the into the environment, and how do you how does your small space, um, your little house, how does it feel bigger? Um, and this upper upper left slide is really about your the the, the buildings fitting into the landscape and, and seeing that that view out. So if you're sitting on your front porch and you've got the view, well, it's it's it really feels open. Um, and then, so, you know, how do these buildings sit into the landscape? This middle uh, slide up here is a, these nice, simple, fairly simple little homes all uh, grouped together sitting in the landscape that actually um, can look and feel really nice in there. Uh, the next slide that we, we, so we think about like, what are, what are the distant views? What is the surrounding um, nature and landscape? How does this sit on the land itself? Um, but then also the material choices and the types of forms. So this upper right here are actually small homes. There's four of them in that picture. Um, and the types of materials really blend in nicely with the environment and the colors that they use. So it doesn't stick out necessarily. Uh, this lower left one is, you know, what can we do with the space that we've created? Is it a playground? Is it... Um, you know, do we want places to play? And I think it's important to be able to have active and, you know, um, landscape and also um, landscapes that you can just look out onto. So this, this middle slide here is about pushing the buildings out of the way a little bit to create some of that space. Um, and then from your back porch, being able to look out onto, out onto the landscape. So these are all, about not necessarily the building, but about what's surrounding it and how does it interact with that landscape and how do you create spaces that you feel comfortable both interacting with your community, but also having a little bit of privacy <laughs> maybe um, where you, you don't want to sit in your back deck. You don't necessarily want to have to interact with people. You just want to be able to sit back there and read your book. So those are all the things that we're thinking about. Um, and we'd, uh, we'd like to get more into depth um, on those, the two four important items being what makes it a home for you and what makes it a community and a neighborhood. And once we understand that, we're um, going to be able to start designing. Mm -hmm. Did you want to wrap it up, take it home? No, I think that's great. Thanks, uh, Tom, Amy, and Haley. So I think at this point, we'll turn it back over to Sarah and Nils. And thank you very much. Thanks, guys. So if you haven't figured it out already, it is a really awesome property to work with. And we're grateful for Scott Edwards helping us, for me anyway, to see it through the lens of someone who's really starting from the ground up looking at the community and listening to the people who might be living there about what the what they're looking for in the home. And as we said before, there will be the opportunity for small group discussions about that. And now we're gonna go ahead with Q&A and we do have cards on the tables. If you wanna make a written comment, Katie, raise your hand, Katie in the very back. Oh, she's standing up. <laughs> Katie's got a basket. She's also going to run the other mic. Mm -hmm. Sit back there. So we're going to use a mic so everybody can hear. And we'd like to start by asking the folks that are online if they have questions. And again, we would like to hear first from the folks who are here to talk about their housing needs. They're looking for workforce housing. And so if anybody online has a question, you can raise your hand. Autumn's monitoring. Oh, 
Yeah. Okay. We have some stuff that's coming in in the chat, and we will capture that as well at the end of the meeting. Okay, so I don't see anybody raising their hand right now. Um, if you do come up with a question later, um, please try to get our attention by raising your hand. So folks in the audience, is there anybody that has a question for us or for Scott Edwards about what you've heard? Yes. Uh, can you tell me about the environmental impact of the project? And are you looking for are you looking for workforce housing? No. For your okay. If you could just write that down on one of the quick questions, that would be great, unless we don't have any other questions from folks who are looking for housing. Any questions, curiosities, and anything you've heard? Yes. My question is, um, could I move into one if I'm not in the workforce anymore? Say I could afford it. And I ask that because I had to move, sold my house, I'm not going on and on about that. But now I live in Enterprise and I lived in Joseph for 35 years. I miss Joseph. I miss the Mountain View. I would love to have an ADU or a small house. But I, I am working. I work at the museum two days a week, but I don't know how long that can go. Mm -hmm. And we don't have many houses here for people to look at. Thank you for that. Um, I think this is a, you're, you're not the only person who has raised this question before. And so it's part, it ties back to one of the things that we said early on about what we've heard from the community, what we've learned so far. And that is that there is a need for housing at every income level. So it is difficult to say, you know, we're, we're kind of targeting this middle income housing um, because we recognize that there is a need for more housing at every income level. And I think whether or not those types of homes would be available through programming that we would develop, I don't think we can answer that right now, but we are listening and we are keeping track of those needs. There are challenges associated with that, um, you know, in its own way, depending on what your income is and what's available at that place. Yes. I just, my point was, are you just, I don't want to use the word discriminating. It's not about aging. I love being around children. I could live in, but if it says workforce, is that the criteria that you're using? Or could someone who could afford it in one of these income levels buy a place? I don't think you have to prove that you're actually working. We've gone around and around about this. Nils, what do you think? I mean, isn't it more of an income? Yes. Yeah, it is absolutely. Uh, yeah, our, our certainly our primary goal is around the income and the affordability issue. That's sort of the true characteristics of the missing middle. Um, we have been exploring because we know there is this urgent need amongst all of our employers, whether it's in healthcare or schools or or the local businesses or nonprofits or even local government, but they're they're struggling to fill vacant positions. So we know there's a particular need there. Um, I know in in many other places that are also trying to solve that need that they're looking at um, sort of. Uh, allocating a certain number of housing units to an employer preference model that serves that, but not making it exclusive so that anybody that qualifies on the income level would still have some opportunities to access some of the units. And nothing that we do will violate fair housing law. <laughs> this is another area that we are being very, we're learning a lot about. It's very important. Yes. 
Well, I would, I would, uh, to follow up on Judy's comment, it would be interesting to hear uh, the four yeah. of your thoughts about intergenerational design uh, um, and, and your experience with, with that opportunity problem set. We love intergener intergenerational design. First of all, um, some of the missing middle housing typologies that Amy described. Um, do you mind moving away from yeah, me? Thank you. Um, <laughs> are very uh, appropriate for uh, intergenerational. Um, one of the advantages of this type of housing where you have a slightly increased density, especially like the approach of a stack flat, is that those units, those homes can be truly accessible. Um, and it allows you the ability to prioritize those needing a fully accessible unit to be on the first floor and to make space on an upper floor for those not needing accessibility as a priority. So more family-based living. Um, and so we've been very successful in a lot of the affordable housing develop developments that we've been a part of um, at really making that space for a variety of generations because um, the building typology we're looking at is very conducive to that. So um, in addition to that, you've heard Tom talk quite eloquently about community space. Um, uh, multi-generational uh, developments need to create space that aren't just playgrounds, but there are space for communities to come together. And so a lot of what we're looking at and suggesting in this development is um, creating that space and making that space. And so community rooms like this, um, places where communities can come together and gather. Amy and I got to be involved in some projects in Portland that um, where that was the priority. And so we've made community rooms where our classes could take place, dancing classes could take place. Um, and that was a priority and at the forefront of the actual building design. And so, um, yes, uh, we, we love intergenerational design and um, the missing middle is, and the type of build to take place in that um, building typology are, um, extremely um, conducive to that type of development. I could just add one other comment on that. So um, it's it's feeling more and more like a, a mix of units, um, unit types uh, will serve not only intergenerational housing, but just flexible changing lifestyles. We can't, we can, it's difficult to predict what it's gonna look like five, 10 years down the road, we can forecast but a mix of unit types will not only serve, you know, sort of uh, all kinds of future scenarios in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. So it just feels like the right approach. The, the other thing I want to tag on that is phasing has been mentioned, and we're really looking at the flexibility to adapt as we go along, and a phased approach really helps with that a lot. So that's one of the things we've been thinking about and keeping in mind is that, that this particular project is not something that would happen all at once. Yes. A couple of different uh, yes, questions. Um, with, with the small proximity, is there going to be something set up like a HOA type of deal? Because we get one, if you're in such close proximity, if you get one person that's kind of very difficult and that, it kind of ruins the whole environment for it everybody. And also, um, I, I would talk about the multi-generational because the area is really strongly a tourist-run economy and we're looking, so I, so I work as a teacher, but I also help like with my friend in a restaurant waitress and th there's not affordable housing for the, the, the tourist-run economy. So we're kind of, you're looking at all different and people are starting to re retire but all, generally an older population that you want to push away the young people that with their families that you know, to keep everything going. So there's just, I guess there's a lot to consider, but um, one of the things I would be concerned with, I guess, is the is, is to keep that environment, she bought a place 
sustainable because I guess you have some input if somebody is really out of the ordinary that doesn't, that's what kind of makes it difficult. I don't know how you address that. Mills, do you want to add to that? <laughs> well, I, I can add to that. Sarah. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, there's always, uh, in any association, in any community, there are outliers or people that uh, can be difficult. And certainly in a homeowners association, whatever you call that, or a positive situation, uh, there needs to be ground rules, just like we have here tonight, uh, about what's possible and what's not possible. That's not to say that issues won't arise, uh, but there are lots of mechanisms to deal with them successfully and lots of models out there to, to draw from. I think uh, your second point about uh, a variety of folks in the working community uh, is also an important one. Uh, and Peter's comments about the fact that we'd like to have opportunities for people to move through the stages of their lives in these drawings. They might be single when they start, or a couple, and then they have 14 kids uh, or, or two. Uh, to, to be able to accommodate people as they move through their lives, I think, uh, just like in the larger community of Joseph or any other town, is very important too. So anticipating uh, that kind of thing is important. Recognizing, as Peter pointed out, um, that we really don't know a lot about the workforce of the future necessarily. Right now we're in post-COVID and we certainly have this new phenomenon of so many people working at home. Um, and so uh, maximizing flexibility to to recognize that we don't really know how life's going to go forever and ever is really important. I don't know if that helps. So how so how is that? I mean, what kind of models? You're talking about models like the mm -hmm. nature. How and um, how would that Sorry. be implemented? Could you repeat that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. So how would that? You said talk about a variety of models, but how would that be implemented? Is there like is there would there be something of overseeing the all? Of, I mean, because you're in such close proximity. Usually when you're in close proximity like that, there's an agreement that you sign on to when you buy a home. And you're signing on to that agreement and, and, and uh, the ground rules there. So they're pretty established before you come in. They can be extremely complicated down to the colors of what you can put your house, uh, to a variety of all that stuff. How do you enforce that? There's enforcement, there's ways to enforce it as well. And I, I, I can talk about different ways to do it, but uh, I can't give you a specific here uh, for what we're doing yet. But you, you'll you see that as the thing evolves. Yes. So we're looking very carefully at that issue, and we've been talking with groups around the state and around the West about how they're handling it with their own property managers or with a contracted HOA type of management group. Um, but somehow we need to ensure that we've got a, a plan for that and that people are assured that um, that'll be a good place to live. Yes. Has there been any discussion about a uh, utilizing a condominium complex as opposed to using that as a that as a guy? See, I mean, just as far as I mean, the future. So you're talking about uh, like a for sale? You own the house and the. Well, we're talking about people between forty and ninety-five thousand dollars a year income. So we're not talking about rentals. So right. basically, if uh, there was a condominium that had one unit, one bedroom units, two bedroom units, three bedroom units, and then you could have the progression, and you have the rules, and then it's just free market. Right. And definitely some of these 
housing types lead, uh, lend themselves to being oh, condos right. more than others. And some of them, like the duplex, the townhouse could even be on several little properties. So you're not, you don't have an HOA necessarily, unless there's a common park or something like that. I mean, I lived in Florida for 20, 36 years. We owned one house and didn't own the land. Mm -hmm. uh, another one was uh, we owned the house and the land under it. So there are all kinds of ways to go ahead and create an environment for that. Because my understanding, the whole idea of the workforce housing is ownership. Is it, am I missing something there? No, Peter, you had Yeah, I, I think it's more of an, um, it's less of a design question and more of an ownership model question. So as Tom pointed out, it's conducive. We can design, we do condos and we do, we do for sale, we do for rent housing. Um, from a design standpoint, yeah, there are slightly different um, standards, quality standards typically that people expect when you're buying versus renting, but fundamentally it's um, it would lend itself to either. So it's not something that would necessarily drive our design process. It's more of a decision about ownership, which I would defer to allow our resources on. Well, I'd like to ask all our resources what their position on that is. Well, one thing I want to know is that the housing survey when you looked at the, when we looked at the respondents who were in the, that bracket of income, and we asked them, what is your preference as a type of housing? Many of them did say home ownership, but there were also quite a few who are looking for rentals. And so I don't, we can say, you know, just based on that range of income, we can't assume that we'll meet people's needs is going to be a home ownership model. Um, the EM and M building is an example of working homes, looking at a variety of options to meet people's needs. Those are non, you know, those are apartments that are, um, you know, we want to keep that kind of housing available, and there may be more rental housing that could be developed, whether it's apartments or it could be the ADU where you have somebody who wants to, you know, it could be someone who wants to move into a smaller home and they own their home and they put an ADU on their property and they rent their, their other house out for workforce housing. So I don't think that the rent, the rental isn't necessarily dictated by how much income people are making. It can make, on the low end, it can make home ownership difficult um, because of the, the price point for owning your own home. But you know, some of the things like you were saying with condominiums or other kinds of smaller units or even the home housing does still give people an opportunity to build equity. And that is another community value that engagement from the community has brought into the conversation that's also one that working homes started out with. We want to keep in mind as we think about the variety of housing types and what are the opportunities that are you know, brought forward to us that we can potentially work with, are they contributing to that value of providing opportunities to, to build wealth? You want to add yeah. Yes. Um, Just a matter of curiosity um, with um, the potential jobs in the county and um, the, the income that would be required for this program, was it 45 to 95 or something like that? Um, what would a family be able to have uh, afford to pay for rent um, or a mortgage, a monthly rent or mortgage in, uh, who had that income? So, um, one of the kind of rules of thumb when you think about what's affordable to someone is ideally you don't want to spend more than 30% of your income on housing costs. And that's not just your rent payment, you know, it's going to, and, and just like it's not just your mortgage payment, it would be, you know, your rent, your utilities, your 
rental insurance, to homeowners insurance, to taxes, all that kind of stuff. And when you think of it in on the rental basis, it's kind of it's e really easy because you can say, okay, I could have one third of my income would be X. That's how much I can afford to spend on rent and utilities if I'm renting. If it's for a mortgage, usually you, you multiply the annual income times three. So for example, if you were making $90,000 a year, you could afford a mortgage for a $270,000 house. And what has to be included in that is you have to have the money for the down payment. So one of the things that we've, or Jeff Petrillo is not here tonight. He is on our advisory team. Jeff's wife, Beth, is here. But Jeff has a strong background in housing development and affordable housing. And one of the things he reminds us about is we are thinking a lot about how we creatively support the, the development side. And Jeff reminds us there are also creative ways to support the purchasing side. So there are various types of down payment assistance programs. Community Connections has one of those already operating here where you can enroll in a special matched savings account if you're a low moderate income and you can save money that is then matched specifically for a down payment on a house. And so there are other, you know, we think about those creative things. Another example on the purchasing side, how do we increase people's purchasing power beyond just keeping the development costs down? And another example that's been suggested by several people doing the housing survey is sweat equity. So Habitat for Humanity type programs and things like that. But that rule of thumb is 30% of your income is affordable. And if you look at the enterprise has done the most recent housing needs analysis, and they have a good explanation of um, what cost burden housing looks like in enterprise. And that's one of the things that was a, an alarm when, when we looked at what people for, were paying for housing, it was an indicator that there wasn't the adequate, you know, an appropriate kind of housing available for people working locally, is that we have a lot of people who are even paying 50% what they make in rent. And many of those rentals are also not, they don't work very well for them. They might be hard to eat, they might be too small, um, it might be far away from where they work and with the cost of fuel, then they have this additional burden that's related to housing, but we don't think of it because it's transportation cost. So yes, it's something definitely, you know. Sure. And uh, again, with a nod to Jeff Petrillo, when we were looking at those, um, that household income range, there's a need for houses down to about $170,000, $175,000. Sort of that's sort of the lower end for, uh, that would be affordable for somebody with that 40,000 and then up into the low 300,000s. That's sort of the sort of the price range of homes that we're looking for. And, and when you look on our, the, the real estate listings for the county, you know, historically and today, there's a, significant um, lack of homes between 175 and 250 um, and uh, and a real need to start to create more housing stock in that range. I have to crack up because I'm a storyteller if you don't know me. So when I think of my starter home, it was a wall tent. <laughs> So I guess starter homes come in a variety of shapes and sizes, but what we're looking for are homes that are comfortable, affordable, and they're not, you know, as our team mentioned, it's not just about what it costs to build it, it's the maintenance of it, the utilities and those kinds of things. Other questions? First off, I just want to say thank you very much for keeping the conversation going um, at city meetings and in the city of Dothuk, we just um, 
we're trying to come up with solutions and we have some things in the works, but we just kept saying, don't stop talking about it mm -hmm. um, because it's very important. Let's keep the conversation going. Um, let's keep the ball in the air. And so I just want to say thank you because it's evident that you guys have put up to the conversation, which is really important. Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. Um, it's part of my job, <laughs> but I just want to bring up um, in Joseph, we have a 25 foot high restriction, which you guys are aware of. And then um, currently right now for zoning, we have a thousand square foot restriction as well. When you guys are talking about the proposed um, footprint being somewhere between 300 and 800, it's not very far off from the 800, but it's pretty far off from the 300. And so those um, ordinances and um, restrictions are in place because that's what was important to um, citizens at the time that that ordinance was passed. Some of them are 50 years old. <laughs> so do we need to relook at that? And so I guess why I'm standing up right now, it's a cry for, hey, if you're a citizen of Joseph, um, show up, tell us what you think, because um, it sounds like you guys want to be good neighbors. You want something that fits in. You want something that the citizens are happy about. So citizens, does that need a revisit or not? And so I guess um, let us know what you think. And thank you all. Yes, and thanks to all the public officials who are in the room because most of us have not raised our hand to do that job and it's super important and they are volunteers for the most part. Let it to the basket. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else before we I feel like this is like some kind of game show. For us. Okay. Let's see. Oh, good. Some couple of these have been asked. Um, oh, I don't understand that one. Okay, here's a here's one that I I think we do have an answer for. What is the cost of renovating the Wallawa property? Well, we've completed a home inspection and got bids from. Uh, from three contractors to uh, move in this fall, and we're um, looking at probably fifty to sixty thousand dollars to repair and improve that existing home. Was there initial cost for it? Was we're it no needed. No, we're buying it. Uh, <laughs> we are still waiting for the final closing. The final closing will be on September eleventh. We can make it work. Does that answer the question? Is that for rent or for sale? So as I as I mentioned in the previous, we are we have the option of either. So we're going to be working with the city and 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 trying to get a better understanding of what the preference is. But we have the option of making it available for sale or for rent. Um, this one, I think, is a great one for while we have our team here, which is, do you design housing that could be added to, such as adding on a garage, a bedroom, or a family room? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's part of, if we make the, the, the building itself fairly simple, adding things on like back porches, front porches, carports, additional bedrooms, um, is it actually works pretty well. Um, it's if you start with a single story building and want to add a second story, that becomes a little more complicated. You got to plan ahead for the foundation, but um, making something a little longer, a little wider can work pretty well, unless, of course, you're right up against another house. Um, so yeah, I guess it would have to be part of the design of that particular building or house. That it would work well. It might work better with other with certain types of um, housing than others. But um, usually, adding on something like a carport or another bedroom or something can be done fairly easily. 
If that's important to you, we would love to hear that feedback as it would influence the design and the structure of how you all are funding and developing the site. So speak up if that's important. See, we sometimes we don't even know what they need to know. Yeah. Um, so this is about seasonal housing, which is another, we know this is another type of housing need, um, both in terms of the tourism economy, but also the natural resources economy and the agricultural economy. Wow. So um, this question is, could the architects talk about projects they have done that could house seasonal? Uh, well, probably the projects that immediately come to mind when we talk seasonal housing are probably our farm worker housing projects, of which we've done probably a dozen projects around the state, maybe more. I think I could look, but um, well over 100 units, probably closer to 200. Um, is the question related to are there specific design approaches that we would take to seasonal housing that are different from other types? Well, was that in the question? Or just speak to seasonal housing in general. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure. Yeah. So we we that's that's been our portfolio, and so we have definitely designed for that population. Um, it in my experience, it didn't really change the nature of the design process because you're designing for let's call it the maximum use case when the units are fully occupied. Let's say in the summer for the for most of the seasonal folks, um, but but um, we we definitely have had experience, and it it uh, again it, it I think providing a, a multitude of typologies would help serve that population best too, because again it's hard to tell and predict exactly what kind of folks are going to be coming for what season. I feel like you have a comment, Haley. <laughs> From a design standpoint, um, in some of the uh, farm worker housing and um, other, other similar types of developments we've done in the past, these types of community engagement meetings have been very influential in the layout and design of those units. And so in some cases, we've heard that a mudroom is critical um, in farm worker housing, a place to shower upon entering the home. Um, and they have been very impactful to know the layout and design of those homes. And so if that is a need, and we would love to hear more about it. Um, the seasonal housing has come up, right? I mean, it's come up all along, I think, in the in the workforce housing discussion. And there are, I've heard of employers talking about the potential for them to develop their own seasonal housing. And then the question is, what can they use to generate, what can they do to generate revenue when it's not being used? Um, there's also a desire for one of, one of these um, examples of people coming forward in the community and saying, hey, we would like to collaborate to explore what we can do to meet our seasonal housing needs. So a, a number of employers who are wanting to talk about that together. And in some cases they have identified a building or a site that they would like help exploring and negotiating and, and having conversations with the others about. And so it is something that um, is on the table, but it's not one of the three projects we're working on right now. Um, this one is about the, the ADUs, and it's a question about who would decide um, who would decide who would live in the ADU. So an ADU is typically owned by the person who owns the primary residence and the lot. And so I think it would be, you know, normally it's the, at their discretion depending on the local ordinances. Um, if they, you know, what the size of it is, what it can be used for, um, often ADUs as a, um, it's, it's the, the requirement to allow ADUs 
is one of the changes that has come down from the Department of Land Conservation and Development as a response to the housing crisis for cities that have population over 10,000. So places like La Grande have gone through the process of revising their ordinances and codes to allow uh, for ADU development. And I think where working homes, and I would like other team members to speak to this, but I think where working homes could become involved is if the homeowner needs assistance or there's a collaborative approach that would allow them to develop an ADU that would be designated for a range of income. Um, we are interested in doing all this work and engaging all of you and turning over every rock possible to create lasting affordable homes for people working here, not to make something that's a one-off and then when I'm out of the picture, my kids sell it and it's right back on the market at a half a million dollars. So this is part of the consideration, but we want to hear from people who would like to do an ADU and would like to be part of creating more housing options if you know it's something that could only be done if we can figure out a more collaborative and creative way to support that. So I hope that answers the question. One more on the Oh, this is one that um, there is this 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 person was very thorough. They have a lot of questions, some of which we did before. So, but then here's one that I think um, would you guys could speak to. We've we've mentioned about wanting these homes to be sustainable and to have, to have a you know a good footprint. And so this question is um, if it says lead. Lead de design house building, and I think they mean have you have we talked about lead um, design homes or lead certified homes? Who want to speak to that? Uh, we haven't talked exactly about lead, but um, whenever we're approaching a building and a design, we're always thinking about um, the environmental aspects and sustainability. Mm -hmm. Oh, lead leadership, energy, environmental design. It's a program. Um, that you go through and you can get your building or home certified and you need an accredited professional, which would be us or somebody else um, if they've gone through the program. It does cost money, um, but it holds everybody accountable. It holds the designer accountable, the owner, and really importantly, the contractor who's building it holds them accountable to meet the requirements um, that you set out because it's easy to start designing sustainably and then those things start to slip as uh, costs come in. Um, and another part of it is also um, getting incentives. So if, if a program is going to give you money toward um, building sustainably, it really helps if they have something um, that they can hang their hat on that says, yes, you did go through that process and you're not just talking it up. Um, but ultimately, we would want to make these as energy efficient as possible. So you're using the least amount of electricity and fuel to heat and cool your home. Um, daylighting as well. You know, uh, we want you to not have to turn on every single light in the middle of the daytime. Um, and so there's other um, water conservation. You know, what are we doing with the water that's coming off your roof? How are we? Um, letting it drain back into the site or utilizing it in some way. Um, also, what kind of products are we putting on into and on your building? Um, are they going to make you sick? That's something that's been going around. The tighter you make the home, you know, we're, we're putting air seal around the building because part of what takes um, your heat and cold away isn't necessarily all about insulation. It's about air. If air can rip through your house, um, it takes the heat and cold right away. But when you seal these places up, all of a sudden that paint that you put in there starts to smell a little funny. Um, and you don't want that to spend a couple of years getting used to that. So we want to make sure that the products we're using are also um, sustainable. So all those things are standard for us. 
Um, and the codes, the energy codes and the building codes are pushing us all towards that as well. And so as, as that sort of catches up to where we are, I think lead from 10 years ago is current code. So leads are always trying to keep ahead of the code. Um, and then in 10 years, we'll be caught up in that again. So we're always having to learn, always having to keep up. And, you know, something out here, uh, solar panels. I think you've got solar panels on this roof. That's pretty easy to do nowadays. Um, and that can provide energy. They're doing uh, battery backup systems. Batteries are becoming far more easy to uh, maintain. You know, they've got all these uh, cell type batteries that you can, they can go anywhere and take any kind of heat and cold as opposed to dealing with lead acid, which uh, for my RV, I, I can't stand them. But, um, so they're making it easier to be more sustainable, really. Uh, with the types of air-to-air -air heat exchangers now that are coming in, uh, that takes the, the, hot, the hotter the cold air from outside and mixes it with the air on the inside and then puts it into your house so you're not you know, bringing in fresh air that's super cold that you then have to heat or vice versa. So the technology, as the demands from the code and from lead become more stringent, the industry is keeping up with that and pushing it further um, and starting to adopt it and make it uh, what was sort of an experimental thing that cost a lot of money is now sort of standard and a lot easier to put into the project and contractors know how to do it as well. As it relates to design. affordable housing and design, uh, a lot of the sustainable measures that could be and would be employed in this development um, developments would be very much influenced by also the funding. So we will we would work with Working Homes LLC to determine sort of what also the funding is requiring dictating. A lot of times in the in the world of quote unquote affordable housing, which has got a different area median income um, and can range there. Um, the state of Oregon has requirements that we would then need to adhere to based upon the funding that you go after. And um, Amy and I, in doing a lot of the affordable housing projects that we've been involved in, um, Oregon Housing and Community Services has played a very critical role in um, holding these affordable housing developments to actually a higher standard um, than market rate housing. Um, and as a result, we are seeing in a lot of the affordable housing developments um, quite a few sustainable measures. A lot of those developments can't afford a process like LEED, which is, has a higher price tag. And so a lot of times that certification is looking like uh, another program called Earth Advantage. Um, and that program also incentivizes a lot of the wonderful things that Tom talked about. Um, there's also, like you said, incentives and programs like Energy Trust of Oregon, which helps offset those costs. All that's to say is, yes, please, it's a it's a priority. We have to be doing um, and incorporating sustainable measures. Um, but working hand in hand with uh, working homes and how those funding sources help to guide us and offset those costs so that we can do and be better and more proactive um, is uh, definitely how we'll get those components baked in. We may. This is a so, good topic. It's yeah, so maybe you can get us sort of back about sustainable design. I just want to add, I, I don't think I could say anything better than that's already been said, but for any of these credentialing programs for this project or anybody else's home project, there's always available. I want to encourage you all to consider that even outside of this room. Um, bringing back to this project, ultimately, as you can surprise, it's a cost benefit calculation, plain and simple. So to the extent that the project can put it financially, it's a it's a and has a long enough horizon to recapture that higher initial cost, it's a fantastic investment in housing for anyone. I and I want to kind of tag team on what was just said because one of the things I found out, so the services and, and incentives that are out there are changing all the time. And one of the things I didn't even know until the last year was that Energy Trust, for example, has programs that actually help you with your design. 
Um, they can help you, you know, evaluate your design. They can provide support for, you know, figuring out what you could do with your home that would make it more energy efficient or more sustainable. So it's always good to be asking these questions and bringing these things up. So I know um, I've seen at least several people yawn, and that means I'm going to start yawning. <laughs> Um, and so I would like to, to go ahead and wrap it up. And what we have is after this, we're going to go ahead and think about all the information you've provided. Um, we'll take the sign up sheets and get in touch with people who would like to be part of small group discussion. We'll look online for additional people that have signed up. And we're going to continue to use the information we receive to get partners together, look at what our best options are and to pursue those options. And then we are committed to continuing to have meetings and providing updates. Uh, well, our resources does have a website for working homes. It's pretty simple right now. And we'll be, be putting more information up there and building that out um, so that we can have more stuff on there in the, in the future. So I just wanna thank everybody for coming. Um, Go, can you go to the next one? Oh, sorry. So I think we've mentioned everybody that's on our team. We have Nels, Kyo DeMello's not here. Um, Nels is in the audience. Katie's here. Jeff is online while we dumped him, I think. Um, he had a cute little outdoor outfit on. <laughs> yeah, there's Jeff. Um, and of course, Autumn and myself. And we are excited because we are interviewing some candidates for the project manager position. And we're just looking forward to continuing to meet with you. Thank you so much for spending this evening with us. And please help to spread the word to other folks you know that need workforce housing, how they can get that. Thank you.